there, there's this individualism that is associated with kind of Sudbury. Is that something that is challenging? She talked about, about balancing that sort of individualism against sort of membership in the community. How does that mm. land for you guys? Definitely. Everybody has to collaborate as a member of the community. It wouldn't work otherwise. You know, mm -hmm. there, there are resources that have to be shared, for example, even just the talking about the technology. And so we have some limited, you know, tablets and, and laptops, but they're shared. So people can only they have they can only use uh, use them for a certain amount of time or they have to be replaced in a certain place, for example, or we have a small astro pitch. I mean, only maybe 15 people can play on it at once. We have 85 people here. They have to share this resource. So th there's a lot of sharing and a lot of, it's it's just a necessary part of life here that you have to consider mm -hmm. others. So I think that individualism is quite naturally balanced in that sense. Mm -hmm. So obviously everyone has personal freedom. So nobody's forced to do anything that they don't wish to do. Um, but I think that's essentially a, a positive, you know, but then mm -hmm. we, we all want to be social. So inevitably you overcome that individualism quite naturally again yourself, because you, you, you want to be part of the community and not isolate. Right. So I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't really see that. I, I, it seems to me like what you said right at the beginning, the environment and cultivate the environment is what's important and the mm -hmm. parameters of the environment are such that that individualism and community balance this is the agentic schools podcast where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills i'm your host don berg All right, hello and welcome to the Agentic Schools podcast. I'm here with uh, Maura Dignan and, and uh, Gail Nagel of Sligo Sudbury School mm -hmm. and uh, in Donnelly County, County Sligo, Ireland. Is that right? Sligo. I'm going to correct Sligo. you. Sligo. Very good. Right Important. away, Don. <laughs> <laughs> the American accent, you know. Yeah. Um, so we like to start off with, um, tell me a story about a student or family who really took good advantage of your school, of really um, uh, got great benefit, just took advantage and, and shined in the, as a learner in your school. Wow, how, how would we pick just one? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> they all have, they all shine in their own way, I would say. Um, you could talk about a family, I suppose, that transitioned out of another system that it, it and, and really felt that benefit uh, in, in a greater way, maybe compared to their previous experience. But honestly, I think all of the children learn and shine in their own way and mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. gain great benefit from it at different times in their lives, more noticeably, or depending on what they're going through, whether that's emotional learning or whether that's actually having the freedom to really deeply explore a particular topic of interest to them. Mm. But um, it would be really difficult. I would be hard pushed to, to pick just one. Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think in relation to the families, it has a big impact on all of the families as well. The knock on effect of having a happy child or a child who's happy in the learning system or learning environment that they're in is huge for the family. It's, mm. um, you know, both siblings and parents and grandparents, you know, when the child is happy and there aren't all those stresses at home um, that they had previously, it does have a huge impact on the on, on the whole family. Mm -hmm. And it's a learning experience for everybody. You know, it is, a, it's a big adventure and a big journey for, for the whole family. And there's a, a lot of letting go and a lot of, um, you know, difficulties with that at different times and challenges with that. So, I think in a lot of ways that the students and the the families are are on the have you know it's a shared learning experience for them mm -hmm. um, with the de-schooling process maybe that the parents are going mm -hmm. through as well as the children again depending not all of our children have come from a different system some of right. our children have started straight straight away here so it's a really different experience for different families depending mm -hmm. on where where, where they've, they've just come, come from, from. Yeah. sure sure so so um, for a lot of parents, it's a new thing um, to to go into an environment, uh, uh, have their children in an environment that 
uh, operates out of the outside the kind of norm of what you know perhaps they grew up with or or that is expected in the environment so um, what's your what's your kind of how do you approach parents who or just a random stranger who who isn't familiar with what your school's like um yeah it depends on where they're coming from i suppose what their concern is mm. so we would start there with put the question we had an open day yesterday for example so a lot of those that sort of um those questions came up yesterday with people just new to the concept or exploring the concept um and so the you know some of the typical questions are even recognizing their own conditioning as parents and recognizing mm. that while they're attracted to maybe the freedom for their child in this model of education, they're concerned about learning the basics. So the reading mm. and writing is, is, is the question that we most often get asked or at, that's, at a younger age or, or with older students, the, quest, the concern is how will they then move on into further education or higher education or how will they, you know, sort of find a, a, an occupation or a, a career, how will they progress in the world as adults? And I think our society, well, we're so conditioned, really, aren't we, to, to, to see those, to see the requirement or to, to perceive that there is a requirement for instruction in order for a child to sort of reach maturity or, or gain those skills. And so for parents to find the trust in, in that process again, that's, that, that can be quite challenging, I think, for, mm -hmm. for, for some parents. So really what we do is, I suppose, listen to their specific concerns mm -hmm. and then try and address whatever their concern is by showing them examples of how that's uh, done differently or how uh, in, in our experience or what we've seen or how we see children grow and learn in other ways um, and try and challenge or get underneath some of those assumptions that our society mm -hmm. has, has conditioned us to believe. Right, right. I think we use some kind of helpful analogies as well sometimes. Um, one of the ones I think that's been very helpful over the years is when we think about very young children or infants that we don't necessarily have to put them into a, you know, a learning curriculum for learning how to walk and learning how to talk. Um, and that, that can be a really powerful just concept for, for parents to just think about or, or to help them shift their concept a little bit. But that for some reason at the age of four, we think or we're trained or we're conditioned to believe that uh, at that point children can't have agency over their learning anymore and all of a sudden they they need an adult to to tell them what they need to learn and, and how they need to learn it so those kind of things um that kind of maybe open up the, the concepts of education a little bit for for parents um have been helpful i think mm -hmm. um, and as well we, we point them to to other um, resources and mm -hmm. people who've done a lot of research on different styles of learning and in particular self-directed um, education. So there's thankfully an abundance of information available on the, <laughs> on the internet and some, you know, psychologists and other scientists and other people, I suppose, that would have clout maybe in the academic world or people would respect their opinion because of, um, you know, their various accreditations or whatever so that can really help i think for for yeah. parents to to see it as a, a a thing that has been researched and has been um there's been examples of it happening throughout you know a period of time over the last number of years that it's not just some <laughs> completely right. left field uh you know experimental uh, mm -hmm. what's what's also been useful i think is um other parents. So as we've mm -hmm. grown, we're only, we're only in existence six years now in, in this school, but already there's a body of, there's a community. And so there are mm -hmm. parents with some experience and, and their children are growing up in, you know, in, in this model and in this school. And that's really helpful for parents to share that kind of experience with other parents, with younger children or, or with older children who, who have these concerns. Um, and there's, I think that lends confidence, you know, people mm -hmm. can gain confidence from being part of they're not alone and so it, it can feel less isolating and um, it's it's shared you know so I think that, mm -hmm. that's very helpful certainly here yeah yeah um, so so one of the things while we're on parents and kind of the, that process um, what are some of the sort of not just a concern but sort of a myth of education that you have to overcome 
uh, for them to, you know, be more open to what you're up to? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose that the, what I just uh, referred to there, that, that a child needs to be explicitly instructed in something in order to learn it. Um, even really breaking down that whole teacher learner construct um, is something that you know can be helpful for people and, and, and showing and explaining maybe or even exemplifying that learning is a very internal and an intrinsic process for people and um, uh, yeah giving examples I think or, or helping people to see when their child or when they themselves have had experiences in their lives where they've learned something that's been on their own terms in their own way and the, the different quality of that I suppose as opposed to maybe um, kind of a forced learning experience or a coerced mm -hmm. learning yeah. experience so I think helping people to draw on experiences um, that they've had themselves and to see those um, can be helpful. Uh, I think the other myth is that mm -hmm. children need to be disciplined all the mm -hmm. time and somehow their, their behavior needs to be controlled or they'll be unbridled and wild and, and I, I, I don't know what sort of comes up in people's imagination but it's a question we get often asked mm -hmm. how, 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 are, how do we manage discipline you know mm -hmm. um, and I think again it just it, it's a real lack of understanding of, of freedom and, and, and human nature and so mm -hmm. when human nature when given freedom, it self-disciplines, it self-regulates, right, it self right. um, Whereas in a system where control is the dominant feature, then that control is must be evaded or must be in mm. some way um, opposed. And so then you get discipline problems and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. So I think that's a very strong myth, actually, um, that needs to be overcome in order to uh, embrace this model yeah right right and and that's one of the things so so my degrees in psychology and that you know I actually produced one of those papers you could refer to because I studied um, for the village preschool and yeah. village home education resource center and looked at patterns of motivation there um, and and so part of my perspective on this comes from understanding people in a certain way and and one of the things that that's really interesting is that there's uh, a, a big component of kind of this how the situation is shaped creates influences human behavior far more than people's intuitions would lead us to believe um, so we think we bring some stable personality into a situation and then affect that uh, whereas the research is really clear it's your personality is not quite as strong as you think it is and or anybody else's for that matter uh, and the shape of the situation really has this big big effect um, and so the, the structure of the situation, particularly in, in democratic schools, is I think something really important to emphasize. So um, part of the way to understand that is to think about the freedom that you give comes within a certain type of structure about how it works. Um, so can you describe um, what the, you know, like how do rules get made? How do conflicts get resolved? Things like that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, um, well, um, it's it's a really it's it's a really important point that you bring up, and what we talk about a lot here is yeah the freedom, but also the responsibility, and mm -hmm. um, also the the community is based heavily on trust and you know trust and responsibility. So, the the school meeting is as with most democratic schools, all democratic schools, the school is run by the student body and the staff body together. And mm -hmm. we all join twice a week, depending on the school, obviously your frequency of meetings, but essentially all of those members of the community are members of the school meeting. And that's the governing body of the school. It's, a, it's, um, it's the body, I suppose, that holds the power. And everybody, whether you're five or 50 or whatever age you are, has a right to an opinion and a right to vote at that meeting. So. It's um, non-hierarchical from that point of view. Uh, so all the decisions that are made, so if a student wanted to make, um, uh, have an idea to bring something, to bring some change about in the school, or they didn't like one of the processes that had been brought in, or anything at all, they bring a proposal. Um, they can bring either a verbal or a written proposal to the school meeting, and um, it gets discussed by all the members present. 
and we either then agree to to implement it or we agree not to or we might go back to the you know back to the person and discuss it further and say well you know it's a great idea but you know there's these parameters or whatever things need to be shifted a little bit before we can agree to implement that so it's a conversational approach it's um it's you know we all communicate with each other in in a respectful way and, and listen to each other um yeah in a respectful way and then we make decisions together mm -hmm. as a as a community um yeah so that's the decision making process mm -hmm. and then conflict resolution um it's similar again we we um we we'd have we have a few different layers maybe i suppose of conflict resolution that are that are going that you know have become part of our culture um over time um informally you know what we what promote amongst the students is um you know self responsibility and speaking up for themselves and communicating clearly with each other we try to we 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 have a kind of a strong uh, culture of consent in the school as well and we would teach the the children that language and about how important it is to um to ask for consent with you know within a game or to ask for permission to to play a certain way with somebody or to join a game so if they have a problem an interpersonal conflict in the moment we would encourage them to sort it out for themselves and mm -hmm. uh, if they can and if they can't then they're always free to come and ask a staff member or maybe an older student for for help and then we also have a system a judicial system we call it the just the just chat committee um, where somebody can write um, write a request to have a conversation with somebody in a, I suppose, a slightly more formal setting. The, there's a group then of uh, the committee is made up of students and staff together, and um, it's still you know it's still very informal, very respectful, very about um, having a conversation. It's not meant to feel you know terrorizing in any way for the students, mm. but. Um, and it's the focus really is on relationship building. So it ha it has, I suppose, different elements of uh, restorative practice and different elements of that uh, weaved into it. I wouldn't say it's any specific, um, you know, type of conflict resolution mm -hmm. in particular yeah. approach. It's kind of developed over time, over the last five or six years, and it's changed a lot. And there's been a lot of um, evolution of it. And um, yeah, so a student then could. Um, write a request to speak to somebody else or a staff member and then we meet we sit down we have a chat um, and uh, sometimes the, the chat is enough and that's fine if both parties feel heard and um, they just wanted to have a conversation other times the the group or the individual or somebody within the meeting might say look I think we need another outcome from this or this has mm -hmm. happened maybe several times maybe that person needs to have um, a few mentor meetings about this or check in with their mentor is there some problem that you know is underlying this behavior that we might need support with or do we need to chat with parents or you know it depends there's a wide range of um outcomes that could also happen from a meeting like that and um, yeah so that's a brief outline of of how mm -hmm. it works so I, I noticed you mentioned mentors um that's a, a new one on me for a Sudbury context so what does that mean for you mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it really means that um, because, well, we're, we're 85 children here and we've nice. grown quite quickly. So mm -hmm. in order to ensure that, that a child didn't sort of feel lost or become, you know, not, not, not find the support that they needed or not be able to navigate those systems like the school mm -hmm. meeting or, or, or the ask for help in resolving a conflict, the way we have set it up is that each staff member has sort of personal, is a mentor, if you like, to a particular group of students. And that changes all the time. The students themselves choose their mentor, so they choose oh, the staff person that they feel most connected to. And that, that changes then from year to year or depending on what their needs are or what kind of activities they're involved with. And really the role of that mentor is simply to check in formally or informally with the students, just keep a kind of a check in and keep an eye on them that mm -hmm. they're that they're doing okay that they're getting what they need um it's not in any way um i suppose a, a pressure to have a particular outcome or goal with mm -hmm. their with their time here um it's really just to kind of protect that 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 they're getting all the information they have and can navigate the freedom appropriate mm -hmm. because freedom needs information in order to be used effectively otherwise um, 
yeah, it, it, it can happen, and particularly with you know younger children or children with particular needs, we'll say, or or, or who don't have the same processing capabilities as others. Um, it, some of these things can be quite challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Um, so, so one of the things that that occurs in schools like this is uh, maybe schools of all kinds, but um, is that there's particular um, kind of code words or jargon that arises. Um, have have any, and, and particularly I'm interested in the things like if, if, if only everyone in the world understood what we mean by some special word or jargon. Uh, do you have any like that that are, that are particularly good or that you find uh, effective? Mm. Nothing I'm just trying to, to think mind. something like, <laughs> well, maybe there's a, the word infringement, I think, is used quite a lot within the school mm -hmm. culturally because it's it's based on one of our community agreements, one of our laws, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty common in democratic schools, that the infringement law. Um, but it's interesting to hear the children use it all the time. It's not kind of a word that you would normally hear. Yeah, <laughs> you you're, know, you're infringing on my piece, <laughs> yeah. for example, uh, as a phrase you might hear, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, and just from a, people understanding yeah. that point of view, like it's a real, it, it's really, really important. There's an awful lot of power in it too, because mm -hmm. it's kind of the, it's the essence of the, of the model. And in, in a lot of ways that, that the child is actually respected to follow their day and follow their interests in whatever the way they want. And, and that's, you know, that's not always possible maybe for the children at home, or it's not always possible for mm -hmm parents to allow that level of um, freedom or to be kind of comfortable enough with that. So I think, yeah, I think that's mm -hmm. the word I'd pick, that, that everybody had mm -hmm. a really solid understanding of mm -hmm. infringement and the ways that we actually maybe subtly do infringe a little bit of, on our um, on our children's, um, you know, growth experiences or on their, you know, yeah, on their activities by maybe making comments or, mm -hmm. you know, putting things in, in place that might restrict them in some way. But, um, so yeah, infringement comes to mind. Mm -hmm. I can't think of any other jargon. I can't think of anything else, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, well, tell us about um, your campus and the kind of community that you serve. Mm -hmm. uh, the campus, I'll leave to Gail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we yeah. bought, um, it's developed a lot again, as Maura said, we've grown mm -hmm. quite quickly over the last five or six years. We bought a, an old um, an old schoolhouse, basically an old mm -hmm. primary national school uh, six years ago now, which had been um, used as a daycare centre for people with Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So it had been adapted from a school into a daycare centre and then we, we've adapted it back into a democratic school type uh, setting. So it's a lovely building. It's in a really nice setting. It's in a rural setting, but we're quite close to Sligo Town as well. So. We, we really did um, strike gold, I think, when we found this place. We were really lucky. Um, and so that's the main, the main building. And then we, we have additional buildings that we've added on and different amenities over the last few years. Um, a really, you know, a, a small enough astro multi-use multi um, pitch, which has been an amazing addition to the, to the school. So there's sports going on all, all you know, all the time, basically rain, hail or shine, and then a barn as well structure. We've we've added on some simple kind of um, very cost effective structure so the children can have shelter really from mm. from the elements because they love to play outside a huge amount. And a lot of the time, all they all they want is a bit of shelter. So so we have various different structures on the site and um, we have a lot of green space. We were really lucky two years ago, well, we identified pretty quickly that we needed to expand um, mm. both our buildings and our site. So we, we bought the site behind us and we bought um, the site beside us. And the site beside us had a little cottage on it. So we've turned that into a nice little workshop space now and, um, and a tech room, a gaming room. And then we have a big green field behind us, um, which the children just come up with all sorts of games and <laughs> around in and, and um, yeah. So yeah, so we're lo lovely. We're lots of old trees and views up to the mountains, and um, and we have plans now, big plans too. We have planning permission has just been almost granted now for a big extension, and um, mm. so that's our next phase. We'll be developing the school and and um, yeah, putting putting on a big extension. Um, 
Yeah, well, that's the site. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then the community. Yeah. So are the families about 30% of the families um, who are who enroll their children here actually relocated and moved here specifically mm. for this school. Wow. So that's from within Ireland and also from other countries in Europe. So we have a very kind of international community here, funnily enough, in the northwest of Ireland. So it's unique from that perspective. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the families are local-ish. So our radius would be, we serve, I suppose, a radius of about 40 to 50 kilometers in every direction. So people travel, you know, some distance um, maybe to, to you, you know, get here and um, every day. Um, yeah, um, it's quite, so it's quite a diverse community. Yeah, sure from a geographical point, point of view. view. I think yeah. mm -hmm. um, it's developed really nicely from a cultural point of view, especially amongst mm -hmm. the parent body, like they, they have some of the parents have organized we're in a we're in a really popular spot here for surfing so mm -hmm. one parent a year ago or so organized a surf club after school so a lot of the parents and students go to that and um the, there are other things there was skateboarding was everybody was fanatical about skateboarding for a while so they all went to the skate park after school i think they have a coffee morning as well a couple of um a couple of times a month and we have full community gatherings at least every term and sometimes more and um, we have a big party at the end of every term and everybody's invited in and brings food and we have a party and whatever you know whoever wants to perform performs and all of those mm. kind of things so that's been really useful and helpful and and um really nourishing i think for the community for parents to get an opportunity to get to know each other a little bit better because they are quite spread out and um, so it can be difficult it's not like in the traditional model here which is the local national school and everybody mm. lives together yeah. and they can all hang out together and um, so that's been very supportive mm. I think for the for the community and especially with people moving the parent community we have they're amazing about helping other people because there's a lot of inquiries when people are it's it's a big it's a big thing to do you know it's logistically yeah. challenging yeah. housing isn't very um there isn't a, an adequate supply of housing around here mm -hmm. so yeah. there's all of those challenges but the existing parents and the parents who have moved are a great support for those you know the incoming parents as well um cool yeah now so so my being in the usa and and you guys in ireland um <clears throat> what is uh, so if you've been doing, a, you know, adding on buildings, you've developed relationships with your local um, authorities of various kinds, um, and you have vendors who, you know, you probably have insurance and, you know, various mm -hmm. things. Are there anything, is there anything you have concerns about in that context, either sort of regulatory possibilities or just, uh, you know, uh, possibilities like is insurance really difficult or, I mean, and yeah, what, what, are there any kind of, concerns about because you're so different from the norm are there ways that sort of uh, that that challenges your your ability to get you know uh, work in in as a school in that environment well in many respects we're very lucky here in Ireland actually because um, it's quite straightforward for us to operate as an independent school and mm. become registered as such through TUSLA, which is the child uh, welfare agency that deals with education outside of the state mainstream education system. Mm -hmm. That's quite straightforward and, and um, regulated in that way. Insurance, you hit the nail on the head there. That's mm -hmm. really the big um, yeah, the big challenge, uh, or was very challenging when we first um, started the school to find um, an insurer willing to cover us. Mm -hmm. um, but we did manage. But it is, yeah, it, and I think it is still very difficult, and mm -hmm. um, it's way more expensive than yeah. I imagine um, other school models might be because mm -hmm. of the freedom and because of the, you know, unusual nature of it or the new nature of it mm -hmm. it's yeah. unknown so there's a premium on that yeah yeah i don't know is there anything else in particular that yeah no and i mind? think in in time like finding yeah. a finding a premises is challenging so we're um we're also part of a network of schools we mm -hmm. kind of formed an association there a few years ago with um we were the second school to open 
um, a school opened in Wicklow two years before. So together we formed an association, Democratic Education Ireland. And there's four schools open now in the country with three, four more due to open in the next two years. So um, that's amazing, really, for such yeah. a small country for us to have um, so many schools open. And it's one of our kind of missions is that we would have it would be accessible for anybody who wants it, you know, in the next 10 years or so. And the reason I'm mentioning that, that the, the thing that comes up as the biggest challenge for new schools to open is finding a place to open and also insurance. But the insurance thing is getting a bit easier now because we're all insured with the same insurer, essentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, now we have to argue the tasks and try and get the the um, yeah the cost down <laughs> uh, because, because there's only one place, I suppose, they can... It's not very competitive from that point of view. Yeah, yeah. Um, but with the local authorities, once you're in a in a premises that's been zoned appropriately, and we all we all have kind of ended up uh, zoning in on old national schools, mm. and yeah. we're also lucky from that point of view. There's a huge glut of old um, mm. national schools sitting around the country because they were all the smaller schools were amalgamated at certain times over our history with bigger schools, and then new modern buildings were built and um, there's loads of old national schools around the place and they have the right zoning and um, right. so obviously you still have the challenge of raising funds to buy them or to you know get some sort of a lease or but um, yeah that's uh, the, the local authorities can't really argue with that because it's, <laughs> the precedent is there for it to be a school um, and they've been I find we found them very very supportive we we were you know got on board with them i suppose very early on at the very mm. beginning of our project we one of the first things we did was have a meeting with the council and ask them you know told them what our project was and asked them where they where we could operate basically and and mm. um, so but they've been really supportive and our and the local community have been very supportive as well and um, having a having a school back here and um, has been has brought a lot into the community and um the neighbours are all really positive about it. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Mm -hmm. So, one of the other things that people have a hard time wrapping their mind around um, is the role of staff. And, and so, t talk to me a little bit, t tell our audience a little bit about um, if you're not controlling their behaviour, what do you do all day? <laughs> Podcast, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it's really multifaceted. Um, what do you do all day? Uh, well, there's a little bit of everything. There's a little bit of, of um, administration. There's a, quite a lot of administration. Um, but mostly it's, it's um, connecting with the children and leading or, leading or following or supporting various projects that they're, all, that they're doing, essentially, or interested in. Um, sometimes we teach classes if they're requested or sometimes support an individual student with a particular um, topic that they're working on. Um, there's staff who have skills in all the areas that I suppose the children need. So we have, you know, woodwork and art and crafts and all of the traditional sort of school subjects you might Im imagine somebody being interested in music um, and then all the kind of domestic arts like mm. you know cooking and craft work and gardening. and gardening and all of that kind of thing so the staff are really involved in in doing those kinds of activities and we're we're essentially role models so we're just you know we're we're, we're being ourselves in the mm -hmm. community um and bringing what we love into the community but also primarily supporting what it is that the children are looking for um, in their, if, if they need support, quite often they don't require any, any <laughs> input. They're, they're more than capable of, of um, you know, pursuing their own games and their own activities and their own projects. But sometimes they do occasionally need a little bit of support with planning or moving on to the next step with something. Mm. Um, and the other big role we have obviously is, is in the, the JC sort of supporting them with interpersonal, with, with, with conflict or maybe emotional difficulties that um, all children have from time to time. Um, so it's, it's very much a nurturing role, um, I would say. Yeah. And, um, and again, there's a lot of, a lot of administration. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> 
that goes along with all of that, just with the running of the, the school and the, the, the site and dealing with the authorities and all those aspects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We put a bit of time as well into supporting parents, having, mm -hmm. you know, organizing parent events and all the other things that go with school, organizing fundraising events, um, yeah, all of those kind of things. And um, we'd have, a, I suppose, a, an important role with regard to safety as well, you know, mm -hmm. kind of keeping an eye on things, not, you know, the children aren't being, they're not under surveillance all the time, okay. but in the same breath we'll you know, notice something, if there's something unsafe on the site or something that needs to be, or if there's activities going on that we, you know, we'll be keeping an eye basically and mm -hmm. um, yeah, role modeling, respectful yeah. behavior and yeah, mm -hmm. all of those things. Right on. Um, one of the things that, that um, tends to be true about schools like that is, is if a random stranger were to pop onto your campus, they would probably look around and say, whoa, why are kids doing that? You know, and that might be, I don't know what it could be, but, but something that's not usual for a school. Now, um, so that leads to both sort of controversial or potentially, you know, safety issues. Um, how do you guys handle those kinds of things? Like uh, some schools have sort of certifications or do you have ways mm -hmm. to uh, mm -hmm. kind of make sure safety is maintained and that people aren't going off and doing something truly crazy? Mm -hmm. We, we do have certifications that's okay. that's also how we handle it and um, so any any uh, activity or any resource that's that, that that requires a certain kind of skill or has some element of, of you know um, as a safety consideration the children have to do a cert so they have to do a kitchen cert if they wish to independently mm -hmm. you know um, use the kitchen or in the woodwork room or even for tree climbing there's a cert mm -hmm. you know how to a tree and how to you know sort of just so we can be confident that the children can do so safely and and uh, you know won't hurt themselves um that's how we handle most of it but then general safety it's it, there are some community agreements we call them rather than laws so there are agreements about where you can go on on the site and mm -hmm. where the boundary is so we don't have a fence for example the the the, the site is open to the car park and then onto the mm -hmm. road so we are operating on trust that the children know that's the boundary and you don't go on the road mm -hmm. so quite a lot of it is is uh, simply through our agreements and and the trust that those agreements will be upheld nice. um, yeah now one of the things that that almost always comes up um, is about screens or video games mm -hmm. um, what's your current state of of, of relationship or agreements around screens children can bring in screens if their parents um, it's really a, yeah it's a parent's decision I suppose if they right. want to give their child that 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 level of freedom and so if a child has a device that they're able to bring to school they're allowed to use it at school mm -hmm. in whatever way they wish so the we have again a cert for that so there's a, okay. a tech cert which just lays out, I suppose, some guidance on how to manage your relationship with tech uh, mm -hmm. in a way that's healthy for you and um, and also to adhere to the laws of the land in terms of what's appropriate content for your mm -hmm. age and all of that. And so students have an obligation to maintain that for themselves, but also for others. So they're not allowed mm -hmm. to share their devices with other people inappropriately. Um, and again, it's managed on trust then. Once mm -hmm. once you've done the cert, um, then you're allowed to uh, yeah, use that <laughs> resource yeah. as right you on. see fit. Yeah. Now, is that something that has been, um, ha has been revisited over time or is that something that's been pretty consistent? Uh, it, I think the, the, core, the core element of it has been pretty consistent, consistent but all yeah. of our certs and all of our policies are kind of <laughs> under constant review. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things staff do a lot of. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I mean, even we have a new tech cert since last May and, uh, you know, I was delivering it a lot with our new students this September and even already now I'm like, oh, that, that bit doesn't work. And, you know, mm. so we're always, or mm. we need to talk a bit more about this and a bit less about that. So you know and also asking the students you know what was good about that what was boring what, what what needs to be added what needs to be taken away so all of those things I think are yeah they're always a work in progress um but the core hmm. yeah the core kind of um 
part of it has been the same from the beginning and we did think a lot about that before we opened and yeah we've got a lot of questions about it mm -hmm. and it's still and it has been over over the years not a massive source of difficulty but I think what I'd say is we have a massive amount of difference in the community mm. around um, people's values around right. screen use yeah. and also their um, what they think is safe and what they think is you know so we would have some people who would have no parental controls would you know entirely trust their child to to manage that and you know they'll have conversations as a family and then we'll have other families who will have a huge you know you know a lot of restrictions in place and time limits and also you know so there's a massive amount of difference amongst them so i think we we uh, we do try to respect um people's family values but in the same breath we hold a line in the school too so everybody needs to understand that it's it's a democratic school so when the children are here we're not going to be telling them you know they can't do x y or z unless it's a you know a, an agreement it, that we've made that they're breaking but um yeah and then we have i think the, the there has been a, a real limitation to to tech for a number of years too because we haven't had any <laughs> in school you know we haven't had any uh, we were donated an imac at the very beginning but that was the only resource we actually had yeah. So and this, so we don't provide it. Yeah, really. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, well, you know, they, it's not really an op uh, option for them to come in unless they have their own device and spend all day, every day on mm -hmm. tech. So, mm -hmm. there's kind of a natural limitation there. Now we have got more laptops in recent times, which is great, and the children are, you know, able to use them and developing their, their skills and interests that way as well. But. Um, yeah, so it is, and, and it can be murky sometimes, but it's the same with anything. We, we just try to approach everything with common sense and conversation. And, <laughs> and, um, and I know that's different for everybody. Everyone has a different, you know, sense of what common sense is, but we just try and talk it out and, and come, up with, we come up with agreements or systems or policies that, um, yeah, that are, are in keeping with the ethos and also are um, beneficial to the community as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, one of the things that that sometimes comes up is the um, kind of sense of of uh, one one interview I did recently was talked about as a sort of entitlement, but there, mm -hmm. there's a sort of um, individualism that is associated mm -hmm. with kind of Sudbury. Um, is that something that that um, is challenging or is that it, like the, 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 they, she talked about, about balancing that sort of individualism against sort of membership in the community. How does that mm -hmm. land for you guys? Mm -hmm. Well, definitely everybody has to collaborate as a member of the community. It wouldn't work otherwise. You know, mm -hmm. there, there are resources that have to be shared, for example, even just the talking about the technology. And so we have some limited, you know, tablets and, and laptops, but they're shared. So people can only, they have, they can only use, use them for a certain amount of time or they have to be replaced in a certain place for example or we have a small astro pitch I mean only maybe 15 people can play on it at once we have 85 people here they have to share this resource so um, uh, th there's a lot of sharing and a lot of it's it's just a necessary part of life here that you have to consider others so I think that individualism is quite naturally balanced mm -hmm. um, in that sense. Mm -hmm. So obviously everyone has personal freedom, so nobody's forced to do anything that they don't wish to do. Um, and, but I think that's essentially a, a positive, you know, but then mm -hmm. we, we all want to be social. So inevitably you overcome that individualism mm -hmm. quite naturally again yourself because you, you, you want to be part of the community and not isolate. Right. So, I, I, yeah, I, I don't really see that. I, I, it seems to me like what you said right at the beginning, the environment um, cultivate the environment is what's important. And the mm -hmm. parameters of the environment are such that that individualism and community balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, very cool. Um, so so one of the things that that I'm curious about is um, because the schools have you know, respond to, very actively respond to the needs and desires of their students, uh, sometimes they require unique resources. Um, are there any particular things in your community that you feel are, are, are like, particularly special to your community? 
Mm, that's a great question. I'm mm. thinking of the request for the infinity pool and the pony yeah. that we <laughs> weren't able to comply with. But um, what has come up that... Uh, I don't think there's anything yeah. really that... Um, I mean, maybe, yeah, I'm just thinking that this... That you things that you wouldn't see in, a, in, in another a, school setting, yeah. maybe the skateboarding, because that um, wouldn't be allowed, yeah. I guess, in a in a <laughs> normal school. school. But even at that, you see, yeah. a lot of the what what has tended to happen, we have the general resources, and then after that, people resource themselves. Mm, really, okay. they bring in their own. Um, now, it's not to say they they couldn't. They could put in a school meeting request for something. Um, maybe the treehouse would be a good mm -hmm. example of something yeah. that was probably pretty unique. Um, a student did put in a request to, there was a lovely tree uh, kind of that was coming to the end of its life just right beside the Astro and he had this idea that building a treehouse there with a lookout gallery over the pitch would be nice. So mm. he put in a request to, you know, have the money spent on the materials and came up with a plan and Mm. built that with staff so that is yeah. a pretty yeah. unique feature here i think people mm -hmm. know we're so used to seeing it now mm. we don't even think about it right. anymore <laughs> but it's a great space you know it's another it's another one of our spaces that we've added on over the last few years and um, but outside of that i think you know you know with music and art and like the, the children who are really into their music and are part of the bands here at school they'll bring in their own electric guitars and their own leads mm -hmm. and because and they'll make sure that they're you know, looking after their own things or, they, yeah, they kind of resource themselves mm -hmm. from that point of view. And we have bought a lot of that kind of kit over the years as well. And um, it is harder in a in a community like this to keep really precious things precious because right. it's just <laughs> such a lot of footfall and there's such a difference in age. And we don't, you know, we do have some spaces that we, um, like as part of the CERT program that we have developed over time that, you can only be in there if you've kind of been granted independent user status and that's been mm -hmm. something that you've you know shown that you can be trusted and um not even trusted but they have the capabilities uh, to use the kit properly so mm. um maybe what we have is just an, we have an enormous amount of space yeah. i really mm. think that that's probably you know something that yeah is is we're really fortunate to have and mm -hmm. gives the children an enormous amount of of, of freedom yes, um, yeah physical freedom you know so I think and little that, outdoor shelters mm. there's a lot of outdoor <laughs> shelters have popped up you know places that the children you know the children do things with resources that you don't think you wouldn't you know like there's there's different <laughs> there's things that are yeah they, they've um you know the log shed and things like that that are actually right. become dens and hideouts and <laughs> Um, or they'll be playing with something and it's just not not what the original purpose of that thing was for at all. So they, yeah, the, there's a lot of, yeah. Creative play. Creative play yeah. with <laughs> things, yeah. Yeah, very and cool. And the bike as well. So mm -hmm. There were bikes on site too and a bike mm -hmm. trail. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, and that came originally from one student, I think, mm -hmm. really wanted to build a bike trail and practice his mountain biking skills. And, mm. and now... They fly around on bikes. They go through phases as well. It's very, right. which is really interesting from, you know, observing learning and, you know, if you're comparing it to, again, what we're, what we would see as mainstream learning, you know, a little bit every day over long periods of time, it's in this setting or, you know, in, in the more natural setting, maybe it's much more peaks and troughs and mm. um, children will engage with stuff really, um, intensely and deeply over a period of time and then they're done with it and they move on <laughs> right um, yeah right on so let's start wrapping up um what i want to do is is, is <clears throat> kind of begin a little bit where we uh or end where we a little bit where we began so tell me a story about a particular challenge that came up um but enabled the school to become better as a result oh. Indeed. <laughs> we need to feed these questions to us first um, so we can, <laughs> we can uh, have some time to think. Um, a particular challenge? Well, uh, what's coming to my mind, and I don't know, is we're, we're both, we're, all, we're parents also mm. of children mm. who attend here. And I think in our early days, that was certainly a new 
a new challenge, you know, mm-hmm. to go from homeschooling where it's just you and your children to you're in here and you're a staff member and your responsibility for your children, but also for other children. Mm-hmm. And so as the children were adapting also, it was everybody was adapting. It was new for everybody. So I think in those early years, there were a, a number of challenges that came up perhaps for staff who were in the role of parent, but also in the role of staff, mm-hmm. and trying to separate that out. Um, and I think that was really beneficial to have gone through that process emotionally as, as the adults, as, as staff members in the school, which made the school much better as, as a result. Mm-hmm. Just the ability to, to be objective and to really, yeah, I suppose, sharpen those skills of, mm-hmm. of remaining emotionally um, neutral or you know mm. sort of, uh, objective in any in any given situation um and then of course learning as parents just you know the number of the, the experiences that a child will have at school the amount of emotional processing they will do at home as a result mm. of maybe what's gone on at school so being able to learn from both the role of parent and the role of staff member um mm. I think there were a number of challenges w- around that in the early years, which were really beneficial um, in the long run. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, yeah, it adds really yeah. deepens your understanding, I think, of what the children are experiencing yeah. and, and how to support them. And then we can share that information or knowledge or experience with other parents mm-hmm. um, who aren't in here all the time. Yeah, and, um, um, yeah no, it's true. Yeah, that's the, that's that's the biggest thing that's coming to my mm-hmm. mind yeah yeah i can't think of anything else yeah. right on right on yeah all right well i appreciate your your uh time and and uh to truly finish up uh how should people get in touch with you to find out more well they can visit our website sligo sudbury school.com we're also on facebook and instagram and all right. of those things um, yeah, that's probably the easiest way, and they can contact us directly through our website. Excellent, excellent. We're just starting a podcast as well, actually. So yeah. nice. Uh, share you with that. Share that with you. Yeah. Two of the students and one of our new staff members have just. Um, we're just. They're going to record the first uh, episode next week. I think. Nice. So. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Well, once again, thank you very much. We appreciate your thank time. You.